welcome everybody here this evening uh, for this really interesting occasion. It's interesting to me as somebody who was born and brought up in London and uh, been engaged with art and artists for a number of years, um, lots of different art forms, performing arts, visual arts, film, whatever, and noticed how these sort of shifts have begun to take place in terms of the way in which the West, to use that kind of general term, look upon or gaze upon Africa. There's still a sense in which Africa is referred to as though it was one single entity, one country, which is something that annoys everybody. But nonetheless, I think there are beginning to be some, in, um, some interesting signs about a shift, as I say, in terms of the way in which people in the West have come to think about Africa, and particularly in relation to African art. Now, I think that the kinds of exhibition that we've got here, and I do urge you all to have a look, and it, the exhibition continues around the back as well, um, later, do have a look. The kind of exhibition that we have here uh, today in what I would think of as a very mainstream gem of a gallery in, in London's West End, feels like it couldn't have happened ten, even 10 years ago. So we see some different things that are happening that are really quite interesting in the art world, particularly, but not exclusively, in the visual arts. So I'm very delighted this evening to have alongside me here three people who are very deeply engaged in the arts in one way or another to discuss some of the implications of these shifts, to look at the ways in which business, arts, um, how that kind of nexus can work, how the two can go together or pull apart, um, what, what are the markets, how do the markets operate, how, where's the momentum coming from, just to have a little bit of a discussion around that. And of course, we will open up to you to on the floor. Now, I just want to check, we've got until 8 o'clock, is that right? Until 8 o'clock? Okay, and, and is that quite strict? I need to... 8.15 is fine. Okay, thank you, Anju. And all credit to Anju for pulling this together as well. It's brilliant. So, I'm going to start by doing a very brief introduction to the panellists. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by um, introducing, introducing on my far left Nkem. Nkem is a, a journalist at the BBC and had a former incarnation as a wannabe actor. So, we can test him out to see whether he can project as well as I can. <laughs> He describes himself as, a, as a, an Africanist and an entrepreneur, but I think you used an expression, was it? It's, it's a new expression. It's a wannapreneur, someone who wants to be an entrepreneur. So you heard it here first tonight, it's coined this new term. And then next to Nkem is Ide, who is a chartered accountant. Now please put away your prejudices about accountants. <laughs> His family is actually in the Guinness Book of Records for having the largest number of English chartered accountants in the family. <laughs> and I like the next line because it says, in his spare time, he is a politician. <laughs> We've got some part-time politicians here. Um, he's a, and a farmer, and an art lover, and importantly for tonight, an art collector. Um, he's also a trustee of the Guild of Fine Artists of Nigeria, and I hope you'll be able to tell us a little bit about that shortly too. And then we're coming to B. He's written novels. I'm sure many of you will have heard of him. He's written novels, plays, and I'm sure uh, many of you will know that his film that he's directed, Half of the Yellow Sun, is... Um, is it, has it been actually released yet? Is it actually been released yet? It's going to be released in April. Goes on general release in April, so I really urge you to have a look at that. But there is actually a special screening this evening after the panel discussion um, at the ICA next door. Okay, so that's our three panelists, and as I say, I'm really pleased to have them along. When we were sort of emailing each other before this session, I set um, a couple of questions, but just to kind of prompt to provoke, really, um, a, a bit of debate to kick things off. So who shall I start with? I'll start with Ken, as you're the journalist, so you should have all, and the, form, and the wannabe actor. Um, perhaps you could tell us a bit about um, your interest in the subject, if you like, for you, and also what you think maybe some of the potential, some of the pitfalls, and how this thing around business and arts, do they work together in that context, in the African context? 
I've spent the last couple of years as a business journalist at the BBC doing mostly radio, but I, I before that my only interest in business was because I had an affinity for money. Um, and I shifted that from just liking money to reporting on money. Um, but here's what's interesting. I think, and this is all down to perception, over the past, ever since man has made art and ever since art has been available for public consumption, I think it's always been married with business. I think the reason we're even having this discussion, we're having this conversation is because right now there is a sense and there's a perception, there's a knowledge, I guess, among people about where these two things merge together. And there's a discomfort, that's what it is more than, more than anything else, there's a discomfort. But the truth is, it has never actually been away. It's always been together from uh, whether it's Catholic popes who are commissioning pieces of art in, in, in Rome, or whether it's Walmart's commissioning a, a piece of art in its big stores. These things have never ever been separated. But I just, I guess now it's just that we, we, we feel a bit more discomfort about it, but it won't go away and it's here to stay. Okay, I'll come back to some of those points you've raised, but meanwhile I'll come on to B. A. B. A. B. sorry. Do you have a, a, a sort of sense of um, how this commerce and art can work well together? It must be quite difficult, I would imagine, in the film world because you're totally dependent on raising money, aren't you? Well, yeah, and um, that's why you, um, I get some of the producers to do that. But absolutely, when we decided to, um, to adapt our views and some people came to that in the same time, very clear very quickly that we were not going to be able to um, make the type of movie we wanted to make. I say we because it's <coughs> easy. Um, <coughs> if we didn't have to raise most of the money in Nigeria. And, um, <coughs> and so I traveled to Nigeria and I spoke to a few friends and we decided to um, do some actual raising there and um, again we raised about 80%.
side starts to kick in where the numbers get large and he looks at insurance, he looks at capitalism <coughs> in his collection. From the artist's perspective also, the artist starts out as somebody who is trained, hard trained, not trained, wondering whether he can make a living from his art. And as he progresses and gets more confident of his skills, his talent, he gets commercial. Now, some artists will betray at an uh, early stage, some at a later stage, and some never. But whether that passion continues throughout the career of the art lover, the collector, the investor, is all an individual character. In each case, it will be different. The gallery owner, too, starts off with the uh, the set clientele in mind, the set art collection in mind, the set artist in mind, the set target market, and moves on through the, the life of the business to get more and more commercial. At the end of the day, it is uh, different for every individual, different for every business. The passion will change depending on the individual's influences in, in, in the sphere of the art. It's, it's really interesting because you, the, the accountant as it were, um, have uh, stressed the issue of passion just now. And B was saying that actually, I'm not saying it's opposite, but it's quite a different kind of approach, isn't it? Because you're talking about the, the commercial side and in fact the people that have invested in the film in Nigeria, from, mainly from Nigeria, have been all about a commercially driven, hard-headed approach yeah, to that. I mean, the passion is a given. It's a, that's a given. You're on, on yeah, your side, yeah. on your side, yeah. as the artist. Yeah. But do you also need passion as a collector, as somebody who, or is it purely a kind of, okay, I can spot that that artist's work will appreciate in X years' time, and, and so on? I, I don't believe you can spot that without the passion. You, you must have a passion to get into the arts, you must have a passion to, to appreciate art and, and follow artists and follow their development. Uh, simply hearing that an artist's work is going for a certain price tag is no guarantee of a good business prospect. And clearly also you may never enjoy the work anyway. So. For me as a collector, I collect what I like. Uh, that's my primary motive. It may appreciate a lot in value, it may not, but uh, the satisfaction comes from the earth first. So, and Ken, you, you pointed to this um, sort of relationship, as it were, between business and commerce and, and the arts, if you like, as being one that's been around for, well, ever since art began, virtually. And, and I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I'm not sort of a, one of these people who says it's either, you know, inherently beautiful or it's something that's instrumental. So I, I, I agree with that. So how do you think, how do you kind of square that circle? Because often people who've got a passion don't necessarily have that kind of business head. And, and I'm wondering also how, when, when you talk about business in relation to your work as a business journalist, to what extent is there a sense that there is a real kind of thriving or potentially thriving commercial market around arts in Africa? It's something which has come on leaps and bounds in the past few years. Um, and I mean, the, the thing is, you start off with stereotypical, cliche pieces of work. But I think the work has evolved to a large extent now. And I'll, I'll, I'll go to Lagos and I'll, and I'll meet artists. And I'll meet performance artists in Nigeria who go to markets and do all sorts of odd and bizarre things. And I'll, I'll say, can you actually make a living doing this? And she'll say, yes, I do. Because people are becoming a lot more aware about it. Um, it's, it's, it's become something which is not just for <coughs> collectors. And I'll go to because in my line of work, I'll interview people who have a lot of money. And you'll go to their homes and you'll be very impressed because it's not just the cliche works of art. This is, the, I mean, they'll have pieces which a lot of thought has gone into, into picking it up. And these are the people who are driving the market. But it's not just that as well. I remember um, visiting my uncle in Washington, D.C. And he, Ellen Atsui, the, the Ghanaian artist, used to spend, used to stay in his basement whenever he went to Washington in the 80s. 
and he just, you know, it's a, it's a gift for letting me stay in your basement. He has a piece of art. And, mm -hmm. and you can imagine how much those pieces of, of art are worth now. Mm -hmm. And that's because there's a lot more of an appreciation for these works of art now than there ever was. And it's, it's, it's down to certain things. It's down to awareness, the fact that you can go on the internet and click on a website and find these pieces of art. It's always been there. And what that does is it creates a market for the artist, which is something which has been difficult for them to find in the past. Because and my, my friends and I have this conversation all the time. Uh, we're discussing the uh, Ifair bronzes, which were the national, which, which were the, um, the, uh, the, the, the British Museum about three years ago. And I remember reading this incredibly sobering article in the, in the time, it was about um, Janusz Czech, who said that he went to see these Ifair bronzes in, in Ifair. And they were sodden, they were beaten by the rain, they were not being looked after. And it's exactly the sort of thing which I look at, and my friends will say, I can't believe these thieving British colonialists coming over here and taking our art and putting it in the British Museum. Well, you were not looking after it. And it's that sort of thing which, which, which breaks my heart. But as I said, there's a lot more of an awareness about preserving our culture, about, um, about exploring what the possibilities are, about saying, well, art is not just the things that were, it's not just the, the, the conventions that we're used to, it's not just fine art that we learn in school, there's a lot more to it than that. And I think people are a lot more aware about it now. Not so much, not so much for collectors from outside Africa and within Africa itself, um, but for, the, for individuals, for people who are never going to be able to afford to collect these pieces of art, have even now a greater appreciation of these things. Okay, can I just stick with you uh, for the minute. Um, in this country, the creative and cultural sector is the fastest growing sector in, in the economy. It contributes billions uh, to yeah, the absolutely, economy. Absolutely. And we've just had a debate on training and skills in that sector, which even here we feel that we're lacking in, especially when you think just, about the future. I, I know, just to, just to point out, Gravity, which won uh, mm -hmm. Best Director, was more or less the British film. That was a film which Alfonso Cuaron said he could not, he, 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 he conceived it 10 years ago. He didn't get it made because he was waiting for the technology to come along to be able to do it. In the end, he shot that film here in Britain. Star Wars is going to start filming in Pine Pine within the next few the next few months. This is there's so much that can be done here. Even though we, we you know the Brits constantly beat themselves up about not being able to do things, not having the ability. Actually, you do have the ability. You're doing interesting things here. Okay, so so with that growth and with the recognition of the economic contribution of the creative and cultural sector here and in some parts of, of Europe too. What about in Africa? Is there, is there a sense in which a whole creative economy can grow up there and, and feed again into the, into the wider economy? One of the things, jobs and so one of the things that I, I like to talk about is Nigerian music and P-Square twins. I don't know how to describe them, they're sort of like uh, two, two Justin Bieber's, they're twins, Nigerian R&B singers. These guys are incredibly popular. They might walk along the streets of Manchester and the only people who recognize them are the Nigerian, Nigerians who live here. You know, if, if, they went to, if, they went, if they went to Deptford or Peckham, where there are lots of Nigerians, they'll be mobbed on the streets. <coughs> P-Square go to Rwanda and they sell out the national stadium. Nigerian music is incredibly popular across the continent. I was reading something about, uh, uh, about this is a, during an independence, 51 Nigerians celebrating 50 years of independence. And there, was, there were reports from different BBC reporters around the continent looking at the perception of Nigerians in, the, in their countries where they lived. And it felt like imperialism. It felt like Nigerians had gone over, gone to their countries and taken over. Music for Nigeria now does what Hollywood has done over the past 80 years. Nigerian music plays on radio stations across the continent. It is incredibly popular. Nollywood is incredibly popular. Kenyans, are there any Kenyans here? I'm sure you can testify to this. Kenyan kids speak in Nigerian accents because of, of the films. Kenyan women wear and carry batty because of what Nigerians wear. It happens here as well. I think for the past, uh, for the past 10, the last census, I think was the first time, either the last census or the one in 2001, was the first time that black Africans were more than people of Caribbean origin in terms of the black populations in Britain. And that is making a difference now. It is part of, whatever black culture is, it is part of black culture. It's cool to be listening to P-Square, it's cool to be listening to Debange. 
it is an incredible part of the economy. Which is why when you go to Nollywood, it's, Nollywood is an industry. It employs hundreds and thousands of people. I remember going to a scene, uh, watching a Nollywood scene being filmed in, uh, this was in January. And the director was no more than 26, 27 years old. The crew were all young people. These are people who trained themselves by watching YouTube videos. These guys had no formal training whatsoever. But the amount of work that goes into what they do, the amount of money that they can get out. I mean, these films are made for $10,000. And then what you get out of it is just astonishing. It is an, it's an integral part of the economy. And in, in a sense, it's the only part of the economy, or, or well, not the only part of the economy, but it's one of the main parts of the Nigerian economy which is still growing. It is, and just to give you, a, to, to, just to explain how this feeds into other things as well. I was in Mozambique last year, and of course, my dream community there as well, said, you know what we want to do? We'd like to bring Nollywood to Mozambique. It will be the same themes, but it will be in Portuguese with Mozambique, and people can understand it. That is the kind of, that's the way you, that's the, that is how imperialism works. <laughs> It's interesting, and I'm going to ask B to, to comment on, on this, because I'm wondering, in, in a way, does some of what um, Ken's just said explain that kind of attitude which says you've got art house material here, and you've got, but you've got commercial and mainstream material over there, as if they're somehow, you know, never the two shall meet? Is, is, that, is that an issue, or doesn't it matter? It doesn't really matter to me. I mean, what bothered me was the fact that um, there was um, a definition of what African movie would be, and that definition basically insisted that it was something that um, <clears throat> that was more like you know, medicine that was good for you, like cooking, you know, it, was, it wasn't something you went out to enjoy. It was a definition of the course of the black people actually you know nothing about what you inhabit. Not in wood, as the camera was saying. Um, what became um, into this thing about the pure accident. Um, there the, was the a group of traders who had VHS tapes, and they had something like 50,000 tapes, and they were trying to sell them. There was no one buying them. And one of them came up with this idea of recording programs, TV drama, onto these tapes, and then selling, um, selling the tapes. And within weeks it sold out and and some of these people had a pioneer spirit, you know, like uh, two people who founded Hollywood and they decided business people, some sick oil salesmen, people who just they decided let's make movies and they started making movies and some of the movies were really terrible at first. And and now the quality by the day, you know, by you know by, by the eggs increases and, and it's um, it's an industry that's um, estimated to make something like half a billion dollars a year or quite is pretty big. Um, and, and these are people who were like um, about about Hollywood. Um, Very um, fine art is a very different proposition, though, isn't it, Edie? So, I mean, where, where does that fit into the picture? If we're thinking about how um, a country might capitalise on its um, cultural capital, as it were, um, how does that relate to fine art, fine art and sculpture? Well, uh, I want to say that uh, whether it's Nigerian music or Nigerian film or Nigerian art, the momentum for the growth of business in all the spheres, it's coming from the same source. We have better communications worldwide through the internet and uh, data flying around the world. Everybody is now aware much sooner as to what is available. Uh, art is, from a business perspective, nothing without value. Uh, the auctions that have happened in the last five to 10 years for Nigerian art, have defined it in terms of value and continue to define it in terms of value. Uh, this show and others like it in the last few years also continue to define Nigerian art in terms of value. Uh, 
Uh, we look at the art around the room, and uh, those of you who are not collectors will be surprised to hear of Nigerian artists. In Ken mentioned El and Asui earlier, uh, his work can go for 200, 300,000 pounds. Uh, Nigerian artists have made that breakthrough and are international already. Uh, for, from an investment and business point of view, uh, art is another means of uh, pooling and storing wealth. Uh, a lot of people may not realize it, but the Investing in art sometimes can lead to returns much better than property, much better than gold, much better than diamonds, jewelry, or all sorts of other alternatives. Uh, I have work that has easily gone up 10 times in value since the time I bought it. I did start 20 years ago, but you know, it, it, and, and Nigerian art will still appreciate it like that. I, I encourage everybody to, to look deeper into Nigerian art and to, to get involved now while the, the train is still in the station. Train's probably gone by. I was just thinking that um, the emphasis has been a bit on Nigeria, um, but it'd be interesting just maybe there's um, somebody in the audience who, who would like to comment perhaps on another um, uh, country or a different region. Of Africa, or indeed to ask any of our panelists any questions, or, or to make a comment about what's been said so far. I mean, essentially, one question might be: essentially, is there any difference between what we're talking about here and what goes on in any country in the world that's got an art market, as it were? Is there any difference? Does it make a difference that it's in? So, um, I, I don't know if you want to use the microphone. Probably not. Can you? Um, I'll probably stand up. Thank you. I live in South Africa. I was born in Ghana, and I'm passionate about art. I collect art. <coughs> I, I buy from Nigeria, I buy from Senegal, I have art from Ghana. Living in South Africa has been a very different experience for me. Um, because I'm so passionate about art, I buy art because I love it, and I try to inspire young Ghanaian artists, and I try to promote their work in South Africa. South Africa has a very defined market, and in trying to um, promote what essentially, therefore, is West African art, it's seen in a very different light. You have to remember the history of South Africa, and the baggage that it carries, and some of the entrenched beliefs that sit so deeply in people's minds, they don't even realize that that affects their way of seeing images and so forth. And sometimes people will look at something and will say to me, it's very African. <laughs> and they'll say, wow, okay. And it's very African for them means I'm not quite comfortable with this. I'm not comfortable with the image. And if you go underneath it and you try and sort of tease out of them without being confrontational, making them feel comfortable, you realize that the ingrained prejudices that they carry with them. Okay, so it's it's a very different feel to South Africa. And South African architecture is very, very defined. Um, and it's, it's going to take time. So people can admire it when they come into my home and they say, wow, God, this is amazing. Don't you have more of that? <laughs> you know? And particularly the ones that depict black people, they find they use the word of people of color. Okay? People are difficult. They have to embrace it in a way around sort of, oh, so what's that about? Um, I thought that was tribal. These are words and images that the baggage of South Africa has affected people. And that's also they're unaware. People talk about apartheid as though it was just something that only white people or well, black people experience. White people also experience their own form of being held back. There was no awareness of anything else. You know, up until 1984 or something, there was no television. Okay, sorry, thank you, thank you for that, because that, that raises some interesting points that might be applicable elsewhere, not only in South Africa, because there is a lot of baggage, obviously, and up until relatively recently here, you know, um, African art, again, that kind of huge label to cover all those different cultures, was seen as, you know, ethnographic, well, it wasn't really art, it was something you put in the, what was it, it used to be the Museum of Mankind, you know, so you put it, you put it there, because it's what tribal people used to do, you know, and 
it's very interesting as an anthropological exercise, but in terms of thinking about it as an aesthetic with defined characteristics and so on, that wasn't at all the case. And any other comments? Thank you. Yes, please. Sorry. Yeah, if, you want, if you've got a quiet voice, you better start. Unless you can talk really loudly, you can take the mic. I was trying to listen to the panel about it's often difficult to try and find somebody in common between different art forms, but one thing that struck me was that historically, regardless of whether it was film, fine art, or any other form, a lot of it only ever came to the attention of the world, not by the people who created it, but by those who championed it, either those who discovered art, commissioned art, chose to fund or distribute or sell a film. I was just wondering whether that was out of view in the much more modern, digital, connected age, whether the position of people who could champion art is disappearing given the fact that people can find art at a click, or is it there's still a lot of space for the individual champions bringing artists to the attention of the world? Thank you. That's an interesting question. It <coughs> suggests that whilst there might be advantages in the digital world, in as much as you say, we can connect anywhere around the globe. <coughs> but by the same time, but by the same token, that sort of um, individual standing up and standing for and discussing in a way that perhaps you can't do on the internet um, might have been lost that voice. What, who would like to address that? I, mean, I, I, I have a theory about, about the internet. It's, it's just a theory, it's not perfect, it's probably wrong. And my theory is that the internet, as much as we like to think the internet has gotten rid of the middleman, I don't think it has. I think what's happened is, because we, we live in a data age, and there's so much data out there being collected by the NSA, among other people. And what, basically, the, the future belongs to those who can take all that data and harness it. And that is what the internet has done. The internet has created so many different marketplaces. And it's easier to find art, but I don't think it's totally got rid of the, the, the champions or the middlemen, the people who go between the artist and the consumer. It's moved online, but it hasn't changed. It's, it's, it's exactly the same thing. So I think for, for, the, for the champion, it's about being more savvy. And in, in fact, what it does is it makes it easier to target those who you want to. You, know, you don't have to physically go and find, find the buyers. The buyers come to you, you know, present a decent website, present the sorts of works of art which you think they'd like to buy, and pay presto. So I don't think the champion is gone. The champion just needs to be smarter and evolve. Did you want to add anything to that? No. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Another question. I think there's somebody behind here. Was there somebody there? Another question. <coughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Comments? Anybody right at the back? I can't see. Yes, please. Can you speak up? Yes, I can. Um, Brilliant. <laughs> sorry. Um, um, what you're saying tonight and what's happening here, I think, is amazing. Because um, when I came to this country in 1999, there was no, there was nothing like this. I mean, this has just come, and I'm so thrilled. I'm glad because when I came with all my African paintings, paintings of Nigerian culture, paintings that I've done, and I really appreciated, I brought them here, took them to galleries, and I got turned down constantly. What I then had to do was to go to school here study what they like, do what they like, <laughs> twist what they like. Today I'm an associate member of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, but I paint what the oil woman likes. <laughs> <laughs> but what I, what, what, still, inside me, I'm still burning, and once in a while I do produce art which my heart longs for. Actually, recently I gave a talk on how African art has influenced what I've done in all my styles and concepts, and it was it was one of the best ever talks that people really they wanted to know more. They didn't know that African art could affect what I do, how it influences what I, what I do currently. So I think this kind of occasion, the exposure, the the people who sponsored it, they're in the right direction, and I hope this can continue and go to higher heights. <laughs> About, it's almost as if you've got the two selves, and I'm kind of the two artistic selves. And maybe, I don't know, maybe they'll always stay separate, or maybe they'll come together, or maybe they're both developing different ways. I don't know, but it, it is it's that thing of how do you keep your
your artistic integrity and at the same time earn a living? It's quite a difficult one, but again, it's an age-old issue. Did you want to say something? No, I was, I was just, just going to pick up on, on a point there. And I think this is, this, this for me is, is something that I, I, want, I usually want to say to investors. And, you know, trust the audience is what I say. Trust the audience, because there's always a perception that, oh, they won't like this, you know, or, and this is what I like to think. It's, if you see something which is very bizarre, and which you think, oh my goodness, that, 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 who would do that? You know, that, that is a terrible film. You, know, you, you see a film and you can't unsee the film. Once it's done, it's done. And, but at the same time, the, the question to yourself is not so much the artist necessarily, but the person who consumes that piece of art. That is, the question is always the person who consumes it. But at the same time, they should be entitled to And so don't question it. And the reason I say this is because, and Hollywood has had this problem for ages, you know, the films which the worthy people think should do well, never do well. Transformers goes to the, goes to the box office and it picks up a billion dollars. Um, at the same time, Dark Knight does the exact same thing. Those are two different films. One is critically acclaimed, and the other one is lampooned and lambasted constantly. And in order to get the sorts of films which people feel ought to be made but aren't being made, it's down to investors to say, quite frankly, many of the investors have the money to lose. So that's true of the matter. Some don't, some do. And I think there needs to be a bit more bravery in saying, Okay, you know what, if I put a million dollars into this film, I might not get it back. But if I do get it back, the returns will be enormous. It's always going to be a gamble. And there needs to be a sense, and, and you know, just to, to, to correlate art with, with farming. Honestly, Nigerian investors who've got lots of money to throw away, put it into farming, you will get that money back. You will get that money back, you will create employment at the same time. There's something similar to be said for art. There, it's, there's, it's possible, to put your money into something which doesn't feel very mainstream. What's the second film now in the box office? I think it's um, uh, the, the, the Budapest Hotel, that um, West Craven, West, West, Craven. West, West, West Anderson film. Um, which is, it's doing decent work. 12 Years a Slave is not in quotes a mainstream film, but it's done very well in the box office. And there might have been people speaking to those who funded that film saying, you, you know, yeah, this is going to come out when you want to awards, but it's not going to make you rich. Actually, it can make you rich, so there needs to be a bit more bravery in saying those works works of art which are African in quotes. Let's do it. Let's see what people like. Let the people make the decision. Let's trust them to be able to make up their minds for themselves. Uh, I want to just make a small point for the gentleman at the back. Uh, Fifteen years ago, maybe you were a bit early for your time, but look around the room. This is African art. And it is commercial. Uh, if this is what you love to do, go back to it. Don't, don't, don't stay commercial. Go back to what you enjoy doing. We call, we call it African art, but really it's just the art. Exactly. By Africans. Exactly. exactly. I mean, because one of the things, if you were to characterize the work, is that it's incredibly diverse. There you go. Well, um, actually, into the gentleman at the back. I think it's uh, unfortunate that you. Um, I'm sure you're a very talented person. Um, uh, I think you should be doing what you feel passionate about. Um, I think, in my experience, I've worked in this country for about 25 years, and the cultural gatekeepers 100% of the time are wrong. Uh, because no one can tell you what an artist is going to like. And for me, what I do is I, I really put out their stuff that I'm very, very passionate about. That's well thought through, and I just basically do the best I can. And, and most of the time, when you do that, you find that um, that the audience responds to it um, really, really, very well. Um, but I think it's important you do what you you follow your piece. It's very important. Excellent advice. Okay, thank <clears throat> you. When I started this, even four years ago, it was a very different environment from what it is today and what it was in 2013. So I also think 
that a lot of people here have contributed to making it what it is now. I agree with him. Four years ago, I got a very, I got very different reception from what we get this year, what we got last year at Oak Street. So, you know, to a certain extent, it's up to us to create the market as well. You know, because there's, there's always challenges and there's always issues and, you know, but today, African art is fashionable. People are saying, you know, we might miss the boat, like someone here said, you know, we may miss the, you know, the train is at the station, like Indy rightly said. We might, you know, miss it. So, to get to this point, how can people like you, who got us to this point? Yes, I mean, it needs to be sustained because um, it's, it's kind of okay to be fashionable, but, you know, ultimately, you want something that will uh, be sustainable because that, that's what we need. And, and that, that's how things develop, and they change from one style, perhaps, to another, or something else comes in, and people <coughs> rethink what they've been doing, their whole practice and everything. So it needs, art needs to be continually kind of on the move, as it were, it doesn't, doesn't need to be ossified. Okay, any more, some more questions and comments? We've got a little bit of time left. Okay. I just think it was great last year, the first contemporary African art fair that we set out. There have been four or five new art galleries devoted to contemporary African art over the last few years. The wind is blowing in our direction. Say <laughs> ours. It's just brilliant. No, it should be said, I think we can say ours with you uh, in mind, Chris, because you've done um, a very interesting. You, you, you fulfilled a very interesting role as a champion, I think, that, that was um, uh, indicated. It was earlier. a very privileged to be there at the right time, the right place at the British Museum. Could but quite easily have gone down the road of the Museum of Mankind. Yes. My dear colleagues at the Museum of Mankind. My dear anthropological colleagues. Um, but we didn't. So we introduced people to the arts of Africa through the work of contemporary artists. And you know that's grown and grown. Pioneers like Sakari Degaskamp, Magdalena Nando, artists from North Africa. Not this business of a single country, that, what they call the Sarah Palin idea of Africa. <laughs> and the whole, not just the whole continent, but the idea of global Africa as well. I think all these things are very, very important. Well, I think that's important, um, and that's sort of been highlighted by the gentleman at the back in terms of thinking about diaspora. But I see I've got another hand at the back there. So Just one thinking. last thing. What a refreshing difference Somerset House is to freeze. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and, and actually, that um, African art fair is going to take place at Somerset House again this year. So um, do come along. It was, it, I think, yes, as you said, it was the first time last year, but it's really, really interesting. Lots of diverse work from the diaspora, and I think that's quite important too. Okay, sorry, you were at the back. Um, my name is Natalie Duck, and I work for a Hello. Hello. I work for a humanitarian agency and a development agency. Um, some of the proceeds from the early screenings of the film are actually going to the work we do in, in African countries fighting from poverty. Now, in our sector, there's a really live debate at the moment about how images of Africa are changing, and where do the images that humanitarian agencies promote in Africa sit alongside this concept of Africa rising? And I, I was really interested in hearing the panelists' view on that, and wondering if they think art is um, a vehicle that can also maybe change this narrative. The feeling in our sector is that a new narrative is needed to, to talk about Africa. It would be great to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you very much, Natalie. I'm sorry I didn't sort of recognise you at first. Um, you know, do you want to say something on that? It's about, it's about images, really. And, and I guess what you're saying is that, I was going to say in the past, but it's still the case today, that we there's still this perception of Africa which is filtered through these media images of starving children and... Um, you know, people, people not capable of looking after themselves, therefore deserving of aid and charity and so on. Is there a way in which the kind of images or imagery can change? Not, not in a kind of simplistic, negative, positive duality, but a bit more sophisticated way of depicting Africa. Sorry. I don't think it's just Africa. I think it's worldwide. Uh, news, which is what most people get the information from, is always on a negative trend. That is what people find the 
exciting or sexy, that's what people watch. I went to South Africa for the first time about 15 years ago. And one of the activities we had while we were there was to go on a tour of Soweto. And we drove uh, in a bus into Soweto and we were going round and you know I asked, you know, when are we getting there? The, the houses have swimming pools everywhere. I mean, <laughs> you, you have this picture of Soweto and the places where they are riot torn slums and nothing like that. But, but that is the image that is given off in the news. That is the image most of the world sees. Similarly, Africa, Nigeria. Again, you have, uh, in Nigeria today, we have some terrorists in the north. But the picture painted about Nigeria is that these terrorists are everywhere. Nothing like that. I remember when I was at university in Manchester, there was a young lady who came from Belfast. We, we all were shocked as to how she managed to live in Belfast. <laughs> <laughs> this was uh, 1981, 82. And she, she, she thought nothing of it. She, you know, she said, yeah, my mother and I regularly ran roadblocks, you know, stuck <laughs> in the car and keep going. The, the impression given by the news and the media highlights negativity always. Uh, those among you who have traveled will have different experiences from all around the world and will definitely attest to the fact that the, the more you travel, the more you understand the way the world works and the way other cultures and other people live and, and, and grow. If you go with the right sort of mindset and, and open mind, I think that's true. So the trouble is some people go with such a fixed perception that they can't get out of that way of thinking. But B, you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. Then I'm going to one of the reasons I started, um, I had to start making my own work, I had to start directing, was because I, um, I got to a stage as a, as a senior father, someone who loves going to the cinema a lot, I love watching movies, and I would go watch a movie that was meant to be about Africa, um, and, and I would watch it, and I want to crawl up the seat because it was just um, really, and it was this thing where what you had more than anything else was just paternalistic pity, nothing else, not no compassion, nothing. You just had, uh, and I would say to friends, it's like making a movie about London and and just featuring homeless people and saying that is London. That's it, nothing else. You know, you reduce um, something very complex to a tiny cliche. I wanted to make movies um, that showed that we were as complex, as great, and as popular. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think that is, as someone who works in news, that is a difficulty because there are still, there are still issues that we're grappling with on the continent. I was speaking to someone who used to work at UNICEF and she uh, she says she stayed in Goma, I'm sure she's somewhere in the audience. And she, she lived in Goma, and I work in news. Goma, North Kivu region of the DRC, is a war zone, more or less. There are all these simmering conflicts which happen across Africa. They're, they're much fewer than they were before, where there are all these problems. With regard to the Africa rising narrative, Africa is rising. There are arguments about whether you believe the figures, because, frankly, you know, that, that whole, whole adage about the, the watchman in it, Indian village, and he damn well puts whatever statistics he wants. The, the, the figures are right, Africa is rising, but not everyone is rising. Okay? The people who've benefited in the last 10 or 15 years from 70% of growth are nowhere near enough for the whole continent to be rising, which is why you had that problem in, in Nigeria at the weekend when 15 people died trying to find jobs in the government. You had 100,000 people go to a stadium to try and get jobs. These are young people. So the narrative is, it's difficult to square these two things of prosperous Africans, of Porsche opening up a shop in Luanda, a uh, showroom in Lagos. Yet a mile down the road, there's no running water. That is the reality. But I think what, what you need to do is be able to, to, uh, to understand the image of fashionable young women with a Blackberry or Samsung phone who's sitting in the dark without any electricity. 
That is the reality of Africa today. It's being able to see that actually, you know what, it's not all bad, but it's not all good. It's, it's trying to meet somewhere in the middle. But here's the thing, and here's the most important thing. I think the images about Africa need to be created by Africans themselves. And I'll give you an example. I spoke to some, some um, startup businesses in January when I was in Nigeria with the BBC in, in, in January. And one of the businesses, that, one of the, the business, his business idea is just to shoot stock images. Because if you go on the internet and say, <coughs> you know, African woman holding baby, or African woman on the phone, or African woman shopping, African woman sitting in the living room. These images do not exist. So all he does is, it's, you know, the, the studio is about this big, it's as big as this, and then he shoots these stock images all day long and he puts them on the internet. These things have not been done. We need to be able to project these images of ourselves. You know, you, if you, you see some billboards, it, 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 it pains my heart and it breaks my heart to see some to see billboards advertising whatever produce it is with a white person there. Nigeria is probably something like 99% black. There's a white person there doing, trying to sell me stuff. You know? So that we need to create these images of ourselves and project ourselves to the outside world. But the truth is, we're somewhere in the middle. You know? Just as, as, as someone, someone was also making the point recently about, you know, would, would I, uh, if I was going to make a documentary, Nigeria's complaining about documentaries in Lagos saying, if I was going to make a documentary about, about London, would I go to Hackney or would I go to, you know, would I go to, would I, would I go to Tottenham, would I do where the riots took place? There's good and bad everywhere. That's what we need to about ourselves. Okay, thank you. We've got time for one more question. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, talking about art and business, um, <coughs> If one looks, at, if I look in this room, most of the artists, I probably find a, a safe of three um, as a family would acquire most of the artists. And it wasn't this year, it wasn't last year, it wasn't five years ago, it was probably about 15 years ago. So it's something where if you appreciate the arts, you collect them. Now, what has happened, we now find, is that that's companies are writing in and requesting to borrow arts to display or for functions. But what is actually really interesting is the fact that they're now requesting we value the works, catalogue the works, and they're willing to lend <coughs> against art, which you would never have thought would happen. And they're talking about actually lending against art, African art. Okay? So things are moving on, things have moved on, and I was shocked to watch a program talking about um, films on CNN, and they were doing a hard talk. I'm sorry, I don't know her name, but she was, she was an, a Nigerian actress, and she was a UN leader because she had three million hits on the internet following. She only films in Africa, she only films in Nigeria, okay? So I believe it doesn't matter if you like it, and you buy it, and you believe in what you buy, it will get there eventually. And I have to correct my husband, they actually appreciate it probably a thousand times. <laughs> okay, um, over the 20 years we started collecting. So it's, it's, it's good that back home, and probably even here now, works that are recognized internationally, will, you will be able to borrow against them. And I appreciate what you're doing here. I appreciate what the champions are doing for art, because we need them, okay? So that it is recognized and seen as to what, it, what we have, you know, what we're taking the journey. Thank you again for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a, very <laughs> a, a lovely piece to close on from the I'm just wondering if our, any of our panelists want to make any final closing remarks before we sign off and hand over. Excuse I was just, I was just going to make a final point in, in addition to what you said. If you look at the people who spend the most on advertising in Africa, there are three sectors of the economy. There are telecoms, there are banking, and there are beer. These are the guys who spend a lot of money. They're the ones who sponsor music concerts, they sponsor art galleries, and what they want is a bit of credibility from the artists. It's as simple as that. So in the end, I think the artist will always have heart, and the artist will always lead, and business will follow that. Because 
in a sense, we live in an age where both are married to each other. You know, both business and art are married to each other. Business these days, and especially because of the amount of choice that we have as consumers, you can't just say, buy this because it's the cheapest. There's got to be something else to it. Is it the design? What is it that makes people want to buy that product? So maybe this is, a champ this is me championing advertising. I don't know what it is. But it's, it's just basically me saying, I, I guess what I'm saying is, businesses have to think a lot more about what it is they're saying about themselves and what you're saying about yourself by buying whatever product it is. And that those two things, have, they've always married each other and they marry each other even more now. Okay, thank you very much. Do you want to? Yes, just a small point again to, to, to just re-emphasize it. Uh, this in the room is Nigerian art. Nigerian art is commercial, it is good business and I would encourage you all to start collecting Nigerian art. This is a good time. This particular moment makes it particularly interesting in, in that context, in the context of that continent. So if we could just say thank you to all of our panelists, please. Thank you. Now, I'm going to introduce, sorry, I'm confusing Excuse me. I'm going to introduce Rose Caldwell, and Rose is the Executive Director of Concern Worldwide UK. She's got over 14 years of experience in working for the not-for-profit not sector. Since joining Concern, Rose has worked in several countries, including Zimbabwe, Kosovo, Angola, Burundi, and Rwanda, and was appointed Executive Director of Concern UK in 2008. She's also a trustee of the Disasters Emergency <coughs> Committee and Vice Chair of the Consortium of the British Humanitarian Association. Sounds like you've got your work cut out there, Rose. And Another one, she started her career as a chartered accountant. <laughs> <laughs> There's something in accountancy I've been missing all these years. Um, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 just to finish off, you've got this stunning CV. Um, and uh, uh, with KPMG, then serving as an internal auditor in the private sector, and as a management consultant with BDO Story Haywood, is that right? before starting her career in the not-for-profit sector as the Assistant Director of the Refugee Housing Association. Rose Caldwell, thank you. I also uh, grew up in Northern Ireland and was one of those uh, ladies <laughs> in Belfast. And uh, when Ken over to England, people sort of wondered how I actually survived. But when I worked in Burundi, it was quite um, interesting because we would drive up to road flocks and argue with road flocks. And it wouldn't bother me at all. And everybody else in the car was very anxious. Um, but I'm listening to the fascinating debate tonight. I'm just hoping my collection of Irish art is going to do as well over the next 15 years as the Nigerian art has done. But I just really wanted to say um, it's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight celebrating the excellence of, sort of West African art and film. Um, and I want to start by saying a huge thank you to uh, Anju and her team at Arbu, I can say this probably, Arbu Art, um, for hosting this evening tonight and for, uh, for bringing everybody together and supporting the work of Concern Worldwide. We very, very much appreciate it. Um, and also to allow us to be hosted here with the Transcending Boundaries exhibition. Um, I'd also like to thank Bill um, and the team at Half the Yellow Sun and so the pictures for support and concern to tell our story uh, alongside the film. I'm very <coughs> fortunate to have actually seen the movie already at the premiere uh, and can highly recommend it. Um, many of the themes that have been, uh, that are told and captured in the film are st still very, very prevalent in our world today. The, the themes of conflict, famine, human suffering and fear. 
Uh, and we still affect millions of people around the world today, as we know from the, as we watch the TV and see the crisis in Syria, the situation in South Sudan. Concern Worldwide was founded in 1968 by a small group of Irish people in response to the situation in Biafra. Um, and famine was very, uh, resonated greatly with the people of Ireland so as it was still in its very recent history. And so uh, the people in Ireland came together and had a huge response to support the people in Biafra and to write to the uh, civil unrest there, um, provided humanitarian response and relief. And indeed, we're still doing that today around the world, uh, working in places like South Sudan and Syria, where we're providing uh, food, shelter, clean water to vulnerable people caught up in situations of conflict. But I guess at the heart of what we do is also uh, addressing the issue of hunger. Um, working in the long term in many of these countries because ultimately we believe that um, you know you can provide education or, or schools for children but if they're hungry they won't learn and um, you can give seeds and tools to farmers but if they're starving they won't be able to work their land and you can provide antiretrovirals to people who are affected by HIV and AIDS but again if they're not properly nourished it doesn't work so the heart of what we do is tackling hunger and working in 26 countries across the world. And I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everybody who has come along tonight and supporting the work concerned worldwide, all made possible by um, the very kind people here tonight. Thank you very much. Now, Angie wants to say a few words, and I, and I really want to make sure she gets a due credit for having organised this and put all of this together. So please give a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panelists very much for being here. I know some of you are going from overseas. You're very, very busy people. So thank you for taking out the time to support us and to support Concern Worldwide. And thank you to all of you for being here. There are drinks uh, in this room and there is a bar on the way to the sculpture galleries. So please view the art, buy lots of art, and then 9 o'clock we go to the ICA for the film, for being wonderful film. Thank you.